is called Institutions and the Regimentation of Participation. Um, we have three speakers, and each speaker will speak for 25 minutes. And I think we'll do what we did with the last session, is that we'll have the three speakers, we'll collect our questions and our comments, and after the three speakers have finished, we'll assemble them here, and we'll barrage them with questions and with comments. So let me first, let me uh, introduce our first speaker, who is E. Summerson Carr, Associate Professor at the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago, my old workplace. Um, so it's wonderful to see Summerson here. And the title of her talk is Lay Participation and the Rhetorical Production of In Expertise. So please, Summerson. Please let, join, join me in welcoming Summerson Carr. First, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. In the June of 1962 at the University of Minnesota Duluth, American psychologist and father of radical behaviorism, B.F. Skinner, appeared before a large, unsympathetic audience. It was a time when political questions were commonly couched in psychological terms, with many Americans viewing the Cold War as a battle between the safeguarding of freedom of thought and the act of suppression of it. Skinner's radical behaviorism was widely associated with the latter tendency. His central thesis of operant conditioning, which he defined as the ongoing shaping of behavior relative to its environmental consequences, had been received as an attack on the cherished ideal that American individuals are authors of their own acts, whose participation in public life is unmediated by external authorities. Thanks to the very same ideals, post-war Americans were also highly skeptical of experts, especially those who took human subjects as their expert object. Even so, the public's critique of expert authority was quite selective. At the same time that readers were lapping up Dr. Spock's now infamously heavy-handed child-rearing advice, they chafed at the Ladies' Home Journal uh, an article in which Skinner described the air crib he designed for his baby daughter to assure optimal conditions for sleep while conserving maternal labor. Skinner's utopian novel, Walden II, in which he imagined a world where punishment had no place and positive reinforcement reigned, was met with similar reactions. Like his psychological theories, the book was cast not just as anti-democratic, but also, by extension, as un-American as well. Indeed, a tellingly broad range of prominent political figures in the United States expressed outrage over Skinner's interests in designing our environments to stimulate and direct ethical behavior. For instance, within months of Noam Chomsky publish, publishing a scathing review which compares Skinner's behaviorist program to a well-run concentration camp, Spiro Agnew issued a chilling warning that Skinner was intent to perform radical surgery on the national psyche. One of Skinner's most vociferous critics was Carl Rogers the father of client-centered therapy, sometimes also called non-directive therapy. Rogers staked his therapeutic program on the premise that clients will self-actualize as long as professionals abstain from overt evaluation, diagnosis, and direction. The strikingly inexpert stance of unconditional positive regard became the centerpiece of Rogers' highly influential approach to psychotherapy. Its central technology was reflective listening, an ostensibly passive process of verbally echoing client statements, which effectively cast the client-centered therapist as supportive witness to the client so centered. In public appearances, Rogers consistently framed client-centered therapy as democracy writ small, the site of unfettered self-expression and full participation of clients, undaunted by expert authority. Rogers once even claimed that his, pati his patients were such fulsome participants that the verbal material from client-centered interviews comes closer to being a pure expression of attitude than has yet been achieved by other means. 
So when Rogers joined Skinner on that Minnesotan stage in 1962, it was no surprise when he asserted that the very survival of American democracy was at stake in the choice between his client centered therapy and the radical behaviorism of his opponent. The exchange was recorded, packaged, and labeled as a dialogue, but played out as a blistering debate, with Rogers on the attack from the very beginning. Relentlessly, Rogers charged that clinical direction is political direction, and behaviorism is totalitarianism, if on a smaller scale. Homing in on Skinner's foundational premise that man is the product of past elements and forces and the determined cause of future events and behaviors, a highly animated Rogers offered. To the extent that the behaviorist point of view in psychology is leading us toward a disregard of the person, toward the control of the person by shaping his behavior without per his participant choice or minimizing the significance of the subjective, I question it very deeply. The genteel Skinner measuredly responded that the goal of any intervention from early education to adult psychotherapy is precisely to direct or positively condition people to act in responsible ways. For Skinner, the pressing political question was not whether to direct people's behavior or participation in public life, but how to do so in productive, non-punitive ways. Furthermore, at an especially critical juncture of the debate, Skinner underscored that no behavioral intervention should have surreptitious elements. With marked subtlety, Skinner also raised the question of just what his opponent may be hiding, suggesting, as Roger's own students did a few years later, that even the most un allegedly unmediated interactions uh, have directive elements, whether the practitioner and client recognize it or not. Yet despite his many attempts, Skinner found himself increasingly unable to persuade the American public, who rejected explicitly directive interventions while remaining critically immune to the less obviously directive uh, elements of client-centered therapy and other participatory modalities. So in the half century following this momentous debate, American psychotherapists have remained deeply divided between client-centered and behavioral approaches if the lines drawn between the two have re-articulated themselves in various ways. But if Rogers reasonably concluded that the basic uh, difference between behaviorist and a humanistic approach, which he also called his therapy, to human beings is a philosophical choice. One flourishing American therapy called motivational interviewing, or simply MI, seized upon that very disjuncture as an opportunity for professional innovation, teaching those who practice it how to be client-centered and directive at one and the same time. MI was first developed as an alternative to substance abuse treatment in the early 1980s by American psychologist William R. Miller. Since that time, the method has spread dramatically across professional fields, including primary care medicine, counseling psychology, social work, nursing, public health, corrections, and even dentistry, thanks to the labor of several thousand professionals who have devoted themselves to training the method to others. As I argue in my book manuscript, the dissemination of MI across these varied fields has a revivalist quality, including, including the spiritual fervor by which professionals feel touched and transformed by it and accordingly take up MI training as their vocation. At the same time, the rise and spread of MI has been in no doubt facilitated by its scientific status as an evidence-based practice with almost 400 randomized control trials uh, to date justifying its widespread adoption, its reimbursement by private and public insurers, and its recognition as a scientifically valid form of expertise. Nevertheless, like Rogers, Miller explicitly dis disavows expertise and warns those who practice his method to do the same, lest they undermine the potential participation of their clients. For instance, in MI's foundational textbook, Miller defines expertise as an anathema to the collaborative spirit of his method. 
He also repeatedly frames expertise as a trap, ensnaring precisely because, quote, the most common effect is to edge clients into a passive role, which is inconsistent with the basic goals of motivational interviewing, unquote. And just in case uh, readers somehow overlooked these prominent warnings scattered throughout the text, the book's glossary of MI-specific terms includes the following entry. So over the course of my ethnographic engagement with the developers and disseminators, thank you, of MI, I have come to learn that the expert trap is not simply a warning against a clinical error, as the glossary entry defines it. It's a familiar caution against political error as well. <clears throat> More specifically, MI proponents aspire for the motivational interview to be a quintessentially democratic interaction, one that achieves the participation of the client as equal party who feels free to choose and pursue her own ends. At the very same time, motivational interviews are intent on directing the client towards specific, normative, professionally supported behavioral goals, whether quitting smoking, uh, sanitizing water, losing weight, or taking prescribed medications. And my uh, in, uh, training involves translating these ostensibly contradic contradictory aims to invite client collaboration and direct clients to particular behavioral ends into a recipe for professional action. Consider, for instance, the Article 8 stages in learning motivational interviewing, compulsory reading in every MI training uh, I've studied. In it, professional apprentices learn that their first task is to develop an openness to collaboration with clients' own expertise. Soon thereafter, professionals are reminded that they should be consciously and strategically goal-directed while keeping the initial charge in mind. Achieving these paradoxical aims in a single interaction takes considerable rhetorical finesse. To be sure, warning apprentices against the expert trap is only half the battle. Apprentices to MI must also master an inexpert register that projects professional uncertainty rather than authoritative knowledge in their engagements with clients, all the while directing them to some behavioral goal. With this in mind, I offer here and elaborate, elaborate elsewhere how the central paradox of American democracy, that is, how to authoritatively direct subjects recognized to be naturally self-governing, is rhetorically resolved through the course of MI training. So uh, I began studying the dissemination of MI in 2009, following trainers around the United States, and at one point embedding myself in a year-long advanced uh, MI training at a large urban social service agency that I call U Haven. Like the other MI trainings I studied, U Haven's training was pragmatically oriented, with no interest or time for theoretical discussions about personhood or pathology. Framing MI as a spirit and style of conversation, the training focused instead on habitu habituating professional apprentices to a complex of rhetorical techniques, including register-specific poetic devices. Through scores of role play exercises and under the watchful eye of their trainer, Kai, who's there in the middle, uh, U Haven apprentices tire tirelessly rehearsed the four primary speech acts that comprise the motivational interview open questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. Later on, the apprentices learn that each of these speech acts come in many varieties, and when properly placed and carefully enunciated over the course of the interview, can elicit different responses. Deeper still into their training, apprentices strive to fine-tune not just what they say in the course of a real-time therapeutic exchange, but also, and more concertedly, how they might productively say it, controlling the tone of an affirmation so as to sound sincere rather than saccharine, punctuating reflections with unconventionally long pauses, and rearranging clients' relatively banal statements in motivational motivation-filled summaries. 
This rhetorical training is rigorous, if not unforgivably so, and so apprentices often squirmed when their affirmations sound, sounded canned. They winced after asking a closed question, which invited a curt yes or no response when they could have asked an open one. They sighed and threw up their hands when they found themselves losing the train of a role played, losing the reins of a role played session they thought uh, they had under their control. And though Kai was always nearby chiming in with encouragement, beautiful, that's right, almost. Apprentices continued to hear themselves sounding decidedly less fluent in MI than they hoped. So while role playing is the primary uh, technique of MI training, it's almost always coupled with demonstrations of the method, including those that have been conducted by the MI, by MI's lead proponents, video recorded and distributed, usually in pirated form. The most popular of hardly the most recent of these films stars a younger William Miller, masterfully demonstrating MI's signature poetics and rhetorical techniques. And so I thought we might briefly wander as if alongside uh, U Haven apprentices through one such filmic portal into a small, dully lit room in an unidentifiable uh, building in an unidentifiable office park in an only semi identifiable region of the United States given the pastel mass produced rendition of a Navajo weaving hanging on the wall. Here, wedged between a faux fireplace and a fake plant, two middle-aged white men swiveling office chairs are pulled so closely together that their lower limbs threaten to entwine. But ultimately, it's a special kind of conversation, the motivational interview that entwines them, almost mysteriously aligning what they say and even eventually what they do. The conversation begins when one of the men, who wears a blonde ponytail along with his business casual garb, currently confirms that he has been sent to this room because he has recently failed a drug test administered by the company where he works long and hard, presumably as a middle manager. The second heavily bearded man, that is William Miller, expresses sympathy with the first man's predicament. He uses the colloquial expression, you got snagged, to refer to the random company-issued drug test, adding, I would imagine you're pretty angry about that. This reflection elicits a lengthy animated account from the ponytailed man who frames the drug test as a violation of his privacy, qualifies his drug use as strictly recreational, and betrays irritation to have landed in such constrained therapeutic quarters. Nevertheless, Miller continues to respond in surprisingly sympathetic terms. He repeats or reflects the ponytailed man's complaints about his company and his defenses of his drug use with little probing and no sign of disjuncture. As if in commiseration, Miller reflects, it happens in your private life and really the company has no reason to be concerned about this. It's none of their business in a way. So I just wanted to give you a sense of what this sounds like quickly here. And you got snagged. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that, that you kind of uh, read about that. That occurred to me in the room. It ties into some of my feelings about uh, my partner. Too loud, I take it. This might do something. Okay. Headset table mic no. Close volume. Uh, let's try again. And you got snagged. Yeah. So I would imagine that, that you're kind of uh, angry about that. Well, it doesn't make me angry. It, it ties into some of my feelings about uh, my personal life and uh, you know, how that I want my personal life to be my own. And that's a private uh, thing that uh, I'm not exactly too crazy about uh, my company or anyone else being involved in. So uh, I, I was angry when I had to go down and. Uh, of course, I knew that when I uh, found a positive result for marijuana, because I believe this is something that I do on my own time in, in my own life. I don't do it at work, and uh, yeah, it, it's, it's an intrusion into my uh, into my life. So it's none of their business, really, anyway. I don't feel that it is. 
and, and doesn't affect your work as far as you're concerned. This is something that's apart from that, happens in your private life, and, and really the company has no reason to be concerned about this. I don't think they should be. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to go as far as to say. Seemingly put at ease by his new agreeable companion, the ponytailed man suddenly begins talking more and more, raising new topics at breakneck speed. The tedium and burdens of work, the relaxation offered by smoking a little weed, the irritation of wives who complain about drinking with the boys. Miller continues to reflect and affirm, and then something unexpected happens, at least from the perspective of the ponytailed man. Suddenly he shares that he uses drugs far more regularly than he initially let on that he uses not only marijuana but cocaine and even heroin, and that he needs drugs to blow off steam considering the pressures of his job, adding that he's uncertain of how he would function without drugs, statements that are quite out of line with his initial account. Just as he had in his earlier conversation, Miller apparently agrees with everything the ponytail man said, noticeably pausing as if now searching for just the right way to reflect what he has now heard. In a seemingly straightforward reflection, he adds new meanings uh, onto the ponytailed man's preceding statements. Drugs are no longer signs of fun, freedom, or autonomy, but index need, dependency, and escape from responsibility. And rather than defending his original position, the ponytailed man, with no apparent alarm or anger, nods through this now deeply critical, is still sympathetically delivered recasting of his past behavior. 18 minutes into the 22-minute interview, the ponytail man offers definitive signal of Miller's success, stating, my drug use has caused me a little internal conflict, I guess. Even with its built-in equivocations and hedges, this is an instance of what is known in MI as change talk. That is, a client statement that animates professional and normative professional goals, even while it is experienced as authored and principled by the client themselves. Adopting the Skinnerian as well as Austinian idea that people tend to believe what they hear themselves say, change talk is understood to have both elocutionary force, functioning like a contract or promise, um, and perlocutionary force, indexing and precipitating future actions like uh, actually cutting down on work disruptive uh, drug consumption. Change talk is therefore the conversational end goal toward which all of MI's rhetorical maneuvers are steered. So Ponytail John, as the film vignette is known in honor of its client actor, is a, a favorite among MI trainers precisely because Miller so elegantly demonstrates how clients can talk to themselves into change and feel like they've done so without obvious professional prodding. At U Haven, Kai used Ponytail John more specifically to demonstrate the special efficacy of reflections, widely considered the most powerful of MI's four central speech acts. Indeed, MI trainers often warn their apprentices that questions, particularly po when posed by clinical professionals, can appear diagnostic, as if simply mining the client for data to, needed to come up with expert conclusions. By contrast, MI reflections as questions in intonational disguise elicit information while deflecting a professional authority and projecting client-centeredness by implying that professional knowledge radically uh, radically depends on clients' verbalizations. So with Kai's tutelage here in mind, the following hours at Haven were devoted to semantically and poetically transforming questions into reflections. And while Kai had originally suggested that the reflection invites the client to assess the professional's developing understanding in terms of its accuracy, he went on to explain that the denotative fidelity of the reflection is in actuality neither necessary nor particularly desirable. 
As his apprentices would later come to understand through their own practice of MI, the more inaccurate a reflection is in a denotative sense, the more potentially productive it is in a performative one. This is because, if deployed at the right time and the right way, the inaccurate reflection projects professionals' current lack of knowledge, thereby inviting uh, clients' further participation. After all, clients' uh, corrections, elaborations, equivocations, and revisions mean more opportunity to articulate professionals' prof- professionals' goals as their own, just as Pony Patel John did when Miller reflected that there was really nothing to be worried about. So ever on guard for signs of expert direction, all these rhetorical maneuvers are for naught if the client is keen to them. And it's here that MI's poetics become particularly important. Take, for instance, the unusually long pauses that you might have noticed prominently punctuate Miller's speech and are eventually acquired by um, all who've received extensive training in MI. Uh, When stylizing reflections, these register-specific pauses sound like hedges, underscoring that the interviewer is uncertain and certainly um, in need of confirmation from clients. At the same time, the the pauses help direct. Because of the uh, unconventional uh, junctures in which they're performed, uh, like after conjunctions and before subordinate clauses, MI's signature pauses mitigate against interruption. They allow the uh, professional to hold the floor and provide uh, precious time to think through how to steer the course of the conversation. And perhaps most importantly, when performed uh, properly, MI's multifunctional pauses also evade awareness of client interlocutors who tend to train their attention on the semantic content of therapeutic messages. So for all of the reasons um, uh, I've just described, um, apprentices to MI uh, commonly say that their practice may be simple, but it's not easy. And well beyond the training room, MI does the hard work of enlightening a particularly stubborn problem within Uh, uh, with which Americans of many stripes have long grappled. That is how to orchestrate uh, 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 behavior that's understood, a participation that's understood to be self-governing. And I also offer a resolution by rhetorically masking rather than abolishing authority and disguising rather than avoiding professional direction, alerting us to the ways that participatory modalities more generally rely on subterfuge. Uh, Miller, uh, uh, if Miller sees MI as a recipe for participatory democracy, it may be precisely because, as he once put it to a room full of captivated apprentices, motivational interviewing as a kind of non-authoritative way, authoritarian way of getting, of trying to move in a particular direction where you, the professional, want to go. So with that, and in closing, I want to just briefly return to Skinner's insistence that the surreptitious control of behavior is inherently problematic. It took well over 50 years for one of Roger's followers to admit that the project of centering clients as fulsome participants so often depends on the unequal distribution of knowledge about the terms and dynamics of engagement. So while MI is first and foremost a therapeutic method method and not a political program, it nevertheless reveals the modes of speaking and listening that are constitutive of a quintessentially American way of managing participation.